Hey, what is going on, everybody? Welcome to a new episode of Tatro Talks. I'm here today with a, a really amazing music producer, mix engineer, live electronic music performer, Hannes Beer, who is coming to us from his studio in Berlin. Today's stream is brought to you by 343 Labs, which is an electronic music school based in New York and online with all of our courses actually available now online because of the pandemic situation. And we actually have one new location that will be coming up and running very soon, but we'll talk about that later. Um, if you have questions along the way during this chat, make sure you put them in the chat. I'm monitoring chat from YouTube, my channel, as well as 343 Labs channel and all the other platforms we are streaming on. But but for now, let me introduce you to our guest, Hannes Bieger. Hannes, how are you today? Hey, I'm good. How are you? I'm pretty good. Welcome. So we are coming from different sides of the world. I'm over here on the East Coast. You're over there in Berlin. It's like, I think one of the main reasons we are doing like this Tetro Talk series is like to feel more connected because we're all stuck at home. How do we, and one of the biggest things for 340 Labs is community and how do we connect students with each other? How do we connect artists with people who are learning, artists with artists, all these things. So I think it, it's really amazing to have you on and be able to have this chat, even though we're on different sides of the world, stuck in our houses or in our studio. Yeah, thanks for having me. I mean, um, the world um, has become small anyway lately. I mean, this is, this is one of the things I, I really enjoy about a global music scene is that um, no matter the distances, no matter the location, basically um, you're always kind of speaking the same language anyway. And so I don't feel any distance at all right now. For sure. I want to take a moment to say hello to everybody who's joining us in chat. So Nikhil, what's up? Renee, how's it going? Manuel, Gerardi, good to see you. Angelico, Zhao, Angelico. Nice to see everybody turning up in the chat. Sebi says, hey, Hannes. And then Chris NYC says, Hannes the legend. They're excited for you, man. They're excited to see you. And we have a few more. Scott Vincent, uh, Tejas, Rudy Oggs, Nachos here, of course. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in on this afternoon. If you like this earlier stream time, we usually stream much later. But uh, for Hannes being in Berlin, this worked a lot better for both of us. So let us know if you like the early stream time. But... Um, let's actually get into it. So you're in Berlin. The, the, the reason we got in touch was initially because you were going to be coming to New York and you had shows booked. So maybe let's just start there. How has this whole pandemic and shutdown situation affected you as a musician and a performer? Well, I mean, there's, there's so many other um, levels uh, we could talk about um, how this um, has affected me and the world and everything and um i'm a very political person anyway so i mean i i can discuss this whole topic on on a range uh, of of different levels and from 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 a number of different viewpoints but um yeah if 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 we just uh view at it from the angle of me as an electronic music performer um uh i tried to make this brief but um the situation was um, weird because um, I was actually uh, supposed to play my first U.S. tour wow. uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so, um, yeah, I just obtained my artist visa in, in late January, early February, uh, right in time for, for um, uh, yeah, getting on the road. And um, I was supposed to play Ultra in Miami also, which had been canceled for a while. Um, but uh, when I actually um, flew out to the U.S., um, none of these travel bans had been um, established yet. So, um, of course, it was clear that at some point stuff was going to happen, but um, nobody knew when exactly, and it just came sooner than expected at some point. And, yeah, so it turns out I flew out to Miami, and, um, yeah, everything basically got cancelled shortly after and um, I was also going to the Bahamas for a long uh, planned holiday. I basically wow. didn't do any any holidays uh, last year for a number of reasons and so this, this was um, something I was very much looking forward to. And then it turns out I couldn't even uh, return because of the travel ban. So and, many levels uh, of disruption. 
Right. And so so I knew, okay, I had to stay in the Bahamas for minimum 14 days because that was the, 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 the time period I wasn't allowed to, to re-enter the U.S. And then um, uh, during that time, everything uh, successively uh, got shut down more and more. And um, by the time I was allowed to fly again, there were no flights anymore. Wow. <laughs> so. Um, one one could view this as some kind of uh, yeah uh, Robinson Crusoe um, uh, stranded on a remote island story, and that is of course the romantic side of it. But on the other hand, um, yeah, I mean, there's not so much fun to to being in that situation when you know that um, your whole professional life. Uh, uh, is is crumbling down alongside the world around you, and then of course there's a lockdown also, and um, at some point you aren't even allowed going to the beach anymore and stuff like that. And so um, if you if you can't go to the beach anymore, um, being on an island obviously is is a bit pointless anyway. For and sure. so in the end, in the end, I escaped on a co-pilot seat of a um, small charter plane back to the US, and then it was another journey back home. And um, yeah, it was a surreal, surreal uh, journey with uh, yeah um, stops in Fort Lauderdale, Miami, Atlanta, Amsterdam, Berlin, and um, what would usually a trip of less than twenty four hours took me four days and a lot of insecurity and rescheduled flights and stuff like that. And yeah, it was. It's a miracle you're even back in Berlin. Well, um, there were a couple obstacles and and. All these uh, were moving targets anyway, yeah. <laughs> because what what seemed a viable route uh, suddenly turned into a dead end street and stuff like that, and so you just had to constantly re reevaluate things and yeah. But right. at the same time, at the same time, I, I I almost don't even dare to say that. But part of it I even enjoyed. I mean, even even if it was quite surreal to when when I arrived in Miami the pool of the hotel was still open and it got closed the next day of course and then then two days later in Atlanta everything was just absolutely I mean you could see no one in the streets anymore and and it was it was and the hotel which has two hundred rooms um uh, there there were like like four guests or so. Wow. And so it was it, like it it was a bit like a zombie movie in a way. Yeah it's it apocalyptic. Was, at the same time, at the same time, I enjoyed one part of it, and that was still traveling, still being somewhere other than at home. Because I knew also when when I flew back, this was this 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 was going to be my my last flight for a very long time. Yeah, well, let's zoom out of that for a moment because that could yes. get very depressing. And uh, <laughs> I, even though it, you seem to have made the most of it, and all's well that ends well, but. You're in a unique position, and I say that because you have a very broad skill set. And I, I do want to zoom out for maybe some of the people who are becoming, who are finding out about you just through this stream, or maybe this is their first experience finding out who you are. So can we maybe give them like the elevator pitch of because you, you have that, you have the production skill set, you have the live skill set, analog gear, all that, but then like um, mix engineering, like you did that for the longest amount of time right earlier in your career before you really went head on into performance right so basically uh the the, the quick rundown is that i basically uh became a musician very early in my life like i i started to play electric guitar when i was 10 and since that time it was kind of clear to me that that um, i i was a musician and and that that this was the life I wanted to to live somehow and um, so from from those early days of course I, I started playing in bands um, in the 90s I gradually uh, shifted more towards electronic music in, in a v variety of different forms and genres and then um, yeah I also of course got more into the production side of things because I just when you make electronic music, this is not just uh, performance music; it's also studio-based uh, music. And so, so it was just a natural progression for me to 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 start uh, playing around with uh, synths and samplers and sequences and all this kind of stuff. And so, yeah, when I moved to Berlin in the late '90s, I I, I started uh, building my studio as my own workspace to 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 making my own productions. And from that, I gradually then progressed to uh, mixing other people's music also 
because it, it was not something I planned, but something that just happened because people started to listen to my records and inquired about the engineers. And um, I always said, sorry, I can't give you any phone numbers. It was just you. It You're talking to the guy already. So, yeah. so it basically started from there. And then at some point um, in 2006, I stopped making music on my own because I just needed a break after um, I've been creatively exhausted. Uh, and um, this break basically uh, turned out to be an 11 year production break. I never meant it to be so long, but um, I got so busy um, mixing and doing studio stuff, uh, working with other people. And so, so it really took me a while to get back into gear. And so fast forward to 2017, I um, started to uh, yeah, make my own productions again after um, having acquired some, some worldwide uh, reputation as a mixing engineer for some of the best uh, known and best artists in our industry and um, yeah since 2018 when my first release after this long break came out um, uh, yeah I just I just um, started to uh, put myself out there as an artist in my own writing and, and this is uh, yeah now uh, starting to bear fruits with uh, my first album coming out under my own name uh, last Friday actually and so yeah here I am and um, as you can tell I've been wearing a number of different hats in my career like, like from an instrumentalist, right. uh, mixing engineer, mastering engineer for a while, even music journalist for a while, um, consultant to several software and hardware companies. Um, I've been writing for a number of, of, of publications in the field of music production, including the uh, UK-based Sound on Sound magazine. And yeah, so yeah, uh, I've, been, I've been indeed wearing many hats in my career. And this also means that um, when it comes to music production, I, I came to, to uh, acquiring a somewhat holistic view of things, which uh, kind of combines all the different disciplines into what I'm doing and so just yesterday I had this conversation with um, somebody else um, and I basically described what I'm doing as um, I'm a finisher in the sense that um, people can come to me with whatever um, uh, state of production they have and I, I if it's consultancy or mixing or additional production or whatever it is I just help them to, to find the best possible uh, path forward uh, getting stuff done basically, and, and coming up with a hopefully great end result. Yeah, I want to talk about when you first mentioned how you got into guitar young, and that was kind of your entry point, because I think it probably relates directly to your use of analog gear, because when you have all these pieces of, when you have like dedicated hardware synths and things like that, that's so much of a closer experience to playing a, a, just an acoustic instrument, like a standalone by itself instrument, rather than, you know, I'm very in the box focused. You, you open the laptop and you're, you're making stuff and it's a much broader um, thing you have access to. It goes not much deeper, but there's so much more details you can pay attention to. Meanwhile, you pick up a guitar, you have a tone knob, a volume knob, and a pickup switcher, and you're playing, and the sound you get out of that instrument is the sound you get out of that instrument. Same thing with a synthesizer with a bit more depth, I'm sure, but are those two things connected in that way? They absolutely are. and I mean, I can, I can only uh, speak for myself about that, but um, this has definitely shaped me. And I mean, playing... Playing guitar or any uh, real instrument, for that matter, is a very uh, physical experience. Like because you're using your hands, your feet, your breath, your lips, your mouth, your whatever. Uh, you, you you connect your whole body to that sad instrument, and and you feel the vibrations. And and it's there's this um, beautiful quote by Bob Moog, who um, the synth maker, um, who. Who I don't I don't remember the exact words, but he said something along the lines of uh, the ideal uh, state of 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 creating music is some sort of feedback loop in between the player and the instrument, where um, it's not just the player giving input into the instrument totally. like a unit direction. It's it's kind of like um, you also get some feedback out of it, and this this hopefully. Uh, 
generates some perpetual uh, loop in which um, you get into a completely different state of mind, actually. And and this is something which, as an uh, instrumental player, I've experienced uh, countless times. And I mean, it's 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 the it's the natural state of of getting lost in music, playing with an instrument. And when it's an acoustic guitar or something, I mean, you're you're leaning you're leaning your bare skin onto the instrument, and you feel the vibrations in your body. And it's just it's just a very it's just a very physical thing. And I think this has shaped me a lot in the way how I um, get inspired in the studio, also because music always has been this physical experience for me. And on top of that, um, I mean, I don't don't want to sound like an older guy than I am, but um, I started uh, uh, playing with uh, synthesizers at a time where soft synths didn't even exist, which of course also uh, comes into play because at that time you didn't have a choice but uh, using a physical instrument that you could touch and that you had to touch and it was only a couple of years later then uh, I think Steinberg Model E was the first soft synth um, available or at least the first one that um, I was aware of but uh, and sonically of course it was not um, not even on par with or remotely on par with uh, what what uh, you could use as some sort of hardware right. I mean we're talking about late 90s and all the uh, coveted, uh, now super expensive vintage synths which could be had for cheap in that time. And, and, and so this is what everybody was using because it was available and it was cheap. And um, yeah, so for me, uh, in my own particular uh, situation and, and personal history with music, um, it has been a physical thing because, um, yeah. So, was speaking of coveted gear, I think the audience would be interested to maybe just peek around because we already see some really cool stuff behind you. But I know right. from some videos that I've seen that you've got lots of cool stuff all around you. Do you want to maybe give folks a uh, just a quick look around of what what there is to see in your studio? Sure. I mean, uh, I try to make this short also, but um, we can just do a quick uh, walk around starting in that corner here which is my uh, EQ rack. Um, it's interesting to note, I mean, my, my console is right next to that, and um, this is a fairly special desk because um, it doesn't have any preamps and doesn't have any EQs either, which means it's a pure mixing uh, solution and not something that you would use to, to necessarily uh, record bands and stuff. And that means just because the desk doesn't have any EQs, um, that whole side rack over here is hardwired to the console. It's not on the pathway and so all the EQs you see here are basically my channel EQs to the console. Okay. And then, of course, there's some monitoring and then uh, if we move over here, there's uh, piles of outboard gear of all varieties, like uh, compressors, EQs, converters, um, plenty of uh, things that you can switch on. Um, yeah, with um, the converters being down here, and this is some, some master um, bus processors I'm using during mix down. Then over here, it's also quite interesting, it's a bunch of analog Delays the original Roland tape echo, the um, uh, echo fix from Australia, which is the latest piece of gear I got here, a pair of Muga Fuga delays, which I've been using a lot on my album. And um, it's quite, having them here is quite luxurious because um, they're mono and together they form a stereo delay. And this is super nice because they're entirely analog, but uh, MIDI syncable. So it's basically a very, very nice um, analog stereo delay. And then there's more EQs and compressors and my tape recorder, which I'm not using so much the, uh, anymore these days, but um, still sometimes gets good use. Then we have a uh, more compressors. Uh, we have some effects units. Um, How many my, compressors does one need? That's that's my question. Uh, uh, you want uh, you want the short or the long answer? Um, let's start with the short answer, and then I'll dive okay, deeper. The, the, the short answer is you don't need any at all. Oh, wow. I like that. Now now long answer. Uh, the long is it depends. 
<laughs> and then, uh, well, the thing is, um, I think, I mean, this, 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 this would be an interesting topic to discuss for a whole night, actually. But, but uh, I think in electronic music, compressors are vastly overrated. Like wow. everybody's asking me about which compressor uh, compressor they should should buy, and I'm always saying, well, please invest the money in room treatment or loudspeakers or even a new synthesizer or something like that. Um, I think compression, I mean, you need it in some situations, but it's not like you have to put it on every signal. And and the big difference is also that, uh, I mean, I'm not only working with electronic music. Um, I have a background as a guitarist in rock bands and mixing jazz um, and mixing different things all the time. And the right. more acoustic uh, music is, the more compressors you usually need. Because um, that's a completely differently structured signal than than a synth or a programmed hi hat, which um, has the same level on any hit anyway. That's but, so interesting because I usually hear the opposite. I usually feel like I hear much less compression in acoustic, or especially jazz. Jazz of all genres, I hear the least amount of compression in jazz and even classical. But um, and that's all acoustic instruments. And then electronic, I feel like that's where I hear the most processing and the most compression. Yeah, but this this is only this is only because people um, have unlimited processing power and unlimited um, plugins, and they want to use them. And and of course, for some some sort of I mean, classical is a completely different thing. But jazz, unfortunately, I must say, has has become this kind of purist um, uh, audiophile whatever um, thing. And if you listen to the the golden era of 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 uh, of jazz recordings from I mean I'm I'm talking about all these uh, uh, all these I have a huge I have a huge vinyl jazz collection and and I'm talking about all these um, brilliant recordings that Rudy Van Gelder made for Blue Note in the second half of the 60s for instance on the early 70s and and that kind of stuff um, isn't remotely as purist as as jazz has become to be uh, has come to be and it's sometimes it's very bold sounding and very very interestingly um, panned and mixed and processed sometimes and it's just uh, yeah gradually uh jazz recordings have become more clean and more pristine but i think they've lost the balls also they 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 are less interesting now Amazing. but anyway um, yeah, like I said, this this is a long topic, and um, if I was only mixing electronic music, um, I would probably have maybe two, three, four compressors here. But um, yeah, well, you need choice. I've been collecting for many years, and I'm doing other genres of music. Right. You see, uh, yeah, Thermionic Contravolta, really nice distortion processor, the um, Ursa Major Space Station, which is a super funky multi tap delay from the 70s, the second digital effects unit in existence, the legendary Roland uh, Bokoda um, sitting here, then we have the preamp rack over here. I mean, on top of it, more compressors, obviously. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have, uh, yeah, my preamps. This is a tree audio channel strip, which I'm mainly using for, for vocal recordings. And there's DI boxes, some super fancy vintage German tube preamp modules, the infamous B72 from the 50s, um, some focus ride channels, another tape echo. So, yeah, this is basically uh, my, my mixing setup. And then Whoa, of, now we'll get into the fun stuff. Yeah, um, the Matriarch, which is uh, a brilliant modern take, Moog had on their stuff. The Prophet 6, which was the first synth I bought after 10 years of not buying any synthesizer. I've got a Cork MS20, which was the last synth I bought before um, my break. Um, it's a weird little um, thing. I'm not using it very often because it sounds so nasty. But um, yeah, uh, sometimes that's exactly what you want to have. And then proceeding over here, um, yeah, we got the two auto reverb and delay panels, which are uh, yeah part of my live set with the 
custom DIY tray that I can put on the Sub 37. Nice. So these are super, super important part of my sound. Then, of course, the memory mog, which I bought in December from Gordon Raphael, the Strokes producer, um, who uh, has been living in Berlin for a long time and uh, just moved to the UK and um, yeah, slimmed down his setup a bit before he, he left. And so I was able to, to buy myself the memory mog, which is incredible because the... Minimog, which is over here, is my Desert Island synthesizer, and this is basically six of them. So this is kind of, kind of, an amazing thing. Uh, then there's a Juno 60, which I think I bought in 1997. It wasn't the first; it was the second synthesizer I bought, but it's the uh, one I'm still keeping for the longest time. Then the Sub 37, which I'm using live also. Uh, if you want to look here, there's uh, a huge pile of cables. That's the stuff that you nice. normally don't need. Oh, I, then, saw, I see the most important piece. It's in the corner behind everything, the small pink uh, piano down ah, there. That might yeah, be the well, most it, important piece. There we go. Oh, Hello, Hello Kitty, nonetheless. Hello Kitty Piano, which was a birthday gift I got from Steve Bug because um, I also have a Hello Kitty guitar. And oh, there also is a um, is a um, Hello Kitty drum set, which is super nice. If you look this up on YouTube, there's there's this um, drum clinic video by the Slayer drummer, and he's doing a drum clinic on the Hello Kitty drum set, which is hilarious. That's amazing. Because, um, <laughs> yeah, because uh, yeah, you just have to watch it. And then um, the Nordlead uh, uh, clavinet, Fender Rhodes piano. Um, some records I've been involved, and then um, yeah, maybe we just quickly go over here because we kind of missed this one. The Minimog, like I said, the Desert Island synth for me it used to be my dream synth in the '90s, and I was never able to to buy it uh, because I couldn't afford it. And at some point in the early 2000s, I could, and it's just um, yeah. Tell me what if, makes the Minimog the the Desert Island synth for you? Well. Um, it's basically, uh, it's one of these infamous music uh, history firsts. Like, it's basically called the Minimog. I mean, it's a huge, big instrument, and it's heavy also. It's like, like almost 20 kilos, I think. So it's, it's not exactly mini, but um, in comparison to uh, this, it's mini. Like yes. what, what people used to have before is the big modulars, and um, this was basically the first uh, self-contained portable uh, uh, pre-wired synth um, somebody has made. And so the first stage instrument, the first stage performance synthesizer. And um, throughout uh, recording history, there, there's so many uh, examples of somebody creating a whole type of equipment, like a portable self-contained pre-wired synthesizer. Uh, for the first time, and those first usually are the best in each of the category, and I think this is because there is nothing, nothing else that could be copied or nothing to compare it to, nothing to rip off. Yeah, yeah. People, people had to just be trailblazers and really create uh, this for the first time. And I think still, I mean, the feature set of the Minimog is somewhat limited, but still you can get crazy filter FM sounds and stuff like that out of it and at the same time it's manageable still like even if you look at the sub 37 it has like I don't know maybe twice the amount of controls or so which is nice also but this is I mean I can I can I can uh, yeah I, I just know what it does I mean you can see through it still and then of course also the sound is just absolutely magnificent it's 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 wonderful it's just um, basically yeah, amazing. Uh, nice. As real, real as it gets. And then, of course, uh, TB303, which also has an interesting history because I got it for free many, many years Whoa. ago. Well, this this Won't see probably that today. 2001 or so. And the thing is, um, I was I was given it by uh, some guy from Cologne, also a techno life act who used to play techno life acts back then already, and. Um, it was broken because somebody had thrown a beer bottle on stage and the beer bottle uh, hit the tuning button Yikes. and 
pushed the whole pot through the circuit board. So everything inside was in shambles, basically. So um, he, he basically said, well, I'm, I'm offering up kind of for free, what, but I want something in return. And I said, look, um, I've got this super nice um, Björk vinyl record, like the, the first one she ever made uh, where she's playing all these um, Icelandic um, traditional songs with a jazz trio. And I said, do you want to have this in return? He said, yes. And so I got the 303 and I brought it to my tech and it cost Amazing me trade. a couple of fixed. <laughs> cost me a couple hundreds to have it fixed and then one or two years later I gave gave it to a friend I mean uh, some some guy I knew back then and at some point I wanted to have it back and said look I'm sorry it's broken and I was like yeah and now what and he kind of left me alone with the broken thing and I thought it would be just at least uh, fair to to split the costs or whatever but um, yeah so I just had the broken thing back and turns out the, the CPU was broken and this is kind of like uh, the unit being brain dead and so I gave it to my tech again and he checked and he said look um, the CPU is broken we need a replacement CPU otherwise um, yeah, there's no use in, in dealing with it and I kind of forgot about it and then 12 years later I went to the guys again I mean I've been there multiple times but 12 years later I went there again and said look um, uh, I've, I've brought you this um, 303 many many years ago and um, they were like fuck there was a, but I don't know if we still even have it and then turns out they still had it, and they had a, a spare CPU. So I had it fixed um, like two or three years ago, maybe. And um, yeah, now it's uh, has been playing a very, very important part on my uh, last releases, also. So Beautiful. A piece with a with a bit of a history, also. And then, of course, over here is the modular corner. I have to step back a bit, of course, with a big uh, Moog uh, modular over here, which is a System 35. It's basically all this This part is the original Moog stuff, and then the top uh, two cabinets is um, uh, mostly third-party add-ons um, by different manufacturers. Um, I mean, the, the market isn't as big and wild as uh, uh, Eurorack, but there's Still, some five U manufacturers, and I think the, some, this is this over here is pretty much something like the, the crown jewels or so. Because I'm not sure if you can see this, but this is a vintage RA Moog uh, okay. low pass filters. It's it's basically it's uh, and this particular one um, doesn't even have the uh, manufacturing circuit boards. It has been made on so called turret boards, which are developer circuit boards. Well, wow. so um, this means that this is um, either a very very early production uh, model or even even one of the prototypes they made before they went into production. So, so chances are that um, this has pretty much been hand uh, built by Bob Moog wow. himself. Um, so everything you have is so rooted in history. I, I wonder if that plays a big role. I think you're a little bit sentimental. I, I would say that. Uh, more well, so, it's, and you get you don't really have that these days with lots of gear, and so your collection is very. There's a story behind everything. I feel. Well, uh, it's it's not as crazy. There's this one of my favorite studios in the world is is a place in Hollywood, and 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 there's a story to everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, here it's a couple of pieces, but but the collection over there is just like I mean, they they have have um, the drum set. Frank Sinatra's drummer has been playing on stage for 15 years, and one of the two vibraphones which have been used on Pet Sound. So this this is a different different level of of history for sure. But again, like I mean, if you if you if you see this here, I'm standing, and so the the sequences are on 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 a on a level on the height of my chest basically so and i still have to pinch me sometimes that i'm standing in front of this this big wall of modular um moog stuff and um dialing in some stuff on the sequencers and and it's still not uh not normal for me it's it's still something that's very yeah i can i can get carried away and overwhelmed by it and it's it's but it's a physical thing, like I said. It's it's not sitting in an office and mu moving a computer mouse, staring in a screen. It's like like dancing in front of the big machine, and and um, it's a physical experience. Right. Um, and of course, there's some. Uh, oh, you're yeah. a Star Wars fan. Uh, yeah. Same. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
as far as history goes, uh, the ARP 2600 here is um, also a very interesting piece because it's an early Tonos model, which you can see um, it has the old logo, the ARP logo. And um, this particular unit has a lot of history also because um, it, uh, it comes from New York, actually. It was um, the, the original owner was Ken Bischel, who who used to be a session um, keyboard player in the seventies, and he was part of the musicians who who played on all the Atlantic Records records. Wow! And so that means that there's some Aretha Franklin records from the early and mid seventies where he played this exact synth, which you can tell because there's this uh, fasten seatbelt uh, sticker in the filter. I'm not sure if you can see it. Pretty much. It's. Uh, over here, and um, you can there, there's old photos of him playing the synth with that sticker on, so wow. that's kind of proof. And I bought it from um, Tone Tweakers in New York. Oh, Tone um, Tweakers, huge, friends uh, of 343. Yeah, uh, huge uh, shout out to them. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's a fantastic, fantastic company, and um, they are actually uh, the ones who uh, told me to get in touch with you for the masterclass. Oh, amazing! So. Um, this unit uh, uh, also plays a role in us uh, speaking together right now. Look at that, from Aretha Franklin to us. <laughs> right, right. So this, is, this, is also, um, this is also a very, very nice, important piece over here, and it comes with the original ARP sequencer, which is, which is one of the greatest analog sequencers. Um, then uh, is my only bit of Eurorack over here. That's a Roland System 500. Next to the Bukla music easel, the DFAM by Moog, which is, uh, yeah, one of my, um, yeah, one of my favorite instruments, actually. And then I've got brilliant uh, pieces over here, like this one. Ooh, fancy. Uh, yeah, so this is. Oh, hello, Kate, I, also. Right. Note. <laughs> Rewind the like Oh, that's priceless. Yeah, it comes with an echo. And um, yeah. And I heard that that was used by the Hello Kitty back in the 70s and on her first tour. Is that true? <laughs> well, um, it, it's not in this room right now, but I told you about my Hello Kitty guitar. And I posted uh, with, with when, when Steve got me the Hello Kitty piano for my birthday, we, we posted a photo of us um, with the instruments and saying that um, we uh, were doing a new live act called the Hello Kitties and posted that on our socials. And then we, we got messages from people who were mad at us and, and thought we would have lost our mind finally and completely Watch and out. thought for real. And <laughs> we're kind of angry that we <laughs> would put our reputations on the line with this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, it's 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 funny. I mean, uh, I don't have the feeling I'm putting a reputation on the line by way of um, yeah, right. having fun with toys. When when my son um, saw my Hello Kitty guitar um, for the first time, when I think he was six at the time, and of course it's pink, and 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 he saw it and he looked at me like Dad. You've got a girl guitar, and I was like, "Yeah, I have a girl guitar." That's amazing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but that's another story. So this is basically, uh, I think, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, we could spend more time. Yeah, we could spend more... so much time, and we just went really deep. And before we go on too far, what what, what I want to talk to you about is like your album that just came out and your approach to making music and live and all that. Before we do that, I want to let people know that um, today's stream is brought to you by 343 Labs, which is an electronic music school in New York and online, soon to be actually in Berlin, which is a, a great thing. We are kind of softly announcing that coming up this summer, um, we will be opening uh 343 labs in berlin riverside studios it's going to be really amazing so if you are berlin based as soon as some of these restrictions come out or if you're even traveling to berlin and you would like to expand your knowledge in music production um, music theory we we have courses for all levels beginners intermediate we have hardware classes in the box classes all that uh 343labs.com to stay in touch there's a link in the description also don't forget if this is your first exposure to hannes 
Thomas and his work, uh, his link is also in the description. You can go and check him out. Make sure you give him a follow. Check out his performances, things like that. Um, I know, Hannes, you're you're kind of everywhere. You talked about your travel at the top, like being based in Berlin with your studio there. But you also, I've heard you talk about like having sort of an affinity for New York. Can you talk about like the two different scenes and what they do for you as an artist? Well, it's it's not just the music scenes. It's also the city itself. I mean, um, something that always uh, struck me as, as as something really, really beautiful is that um, coming from Berlin. I mean, I usually I'm from Hamburg, but I've, I, I moved to Berlin some 20 years ago or so. And so coming from Berlin, um, I pretty much always almost immediately felt at home in New York in the sense that um, in many areas the whole sense of space in the city is so so similar like the the uh, the height of the buildings like okay minus the minus the high rises of course but um, if you're in some some uh, I don't know some some West Village or Brooklyn neighborhood or something like that. Um, the height of the buildings and the, the 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 width of the streets and all like all these the sense of space in the city is quite quite similar as opposed, for instance, to to London, where you have all these um, narrow streets and tiny houses and it's all it's all um, yeah. The, the whole physical uh, dimensions of the of the city are quite quite similar when when we talk about Berlin and and vast uh, stretches of New York, and this this always gave me the sense of of uh, feeling at home in a way because you were walking around in a space that you immediately understood in a way, and this is something that struck me as 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 very very beautiful all the time. But then of course. Um, uh, yeah, it's always this. Um, I have to pinch myself. I'm in fucking New York, kind of thing, because yeah. um, being a musician all my life and um, knowing about the significance of the city and the history of of music and everything, it's it's just, um, uh, yeah, it always has been. I mean, it can be can be a, a draining and exhausting city for sure, but at the same time, it can also be very. Very uplifting to just stand on a street corner and have a coffee and have a look at what's going on and um, you realize you're in New York. This always meant a lot to me. And as far as musical scenes, I mean, there's there's such a such a variety everywhere, like just like here basically. And there's there's so many different things going on. And I've been fortunate enough to to visit so many different. Uh, studios in new york also and peek behind the scenes in so many different places and it's just um i've seen i've seen uh just one example i've seen alicia keys a private studio being constructed when there was only a select uh, like a collection of analog synthesizers in the corner of this huge um open space and then some some uh construction workers uh, smoking weed in the other corner and um, I mean there's just so many so many stories and so much history uh, that I have um, I mean I don't know where to start and where to end actually yeah but um, yeah I, I guess I want to talk about your music so you s just released your first album under your own name um, but what I found as as someone looking from outside uh, like I'm not a regular techno listener I, I have an affinity for electronic music of course um, but when I listened to your music and mainly dove into A Million Souls and then the latest release, Pele, you have a, a delicateness, but then at the same time, it, it, it can quickly evolve into being harder or darker, I guess, a little bit. And I'm almost seeing you as a very sentimental, humble, humble guy. So I'm a little bit surprised by matching up that personality with some of the the a little bit darkness of some of your tracks. Um, is there is there any intentional blend of those two aspects? You know, the light, not lighthearted, but the, the lighter, um, more tender stuff, and then the harsher, more deeper, darker stuff that I kind of hear going out through the record. Well, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question, and it's also a difficult uh, question for me to answer, but I think... Um, well, I'm well past the point where I start uh, making music with a certain concept in mind. What I'm doing is just what's happening and what's coming out of me. And 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 I'm 
I'm pretty much opposed to this way of creating music where you basically uh, give yourself too much of, of uh, I mean, one one thing, or let me let me put it in a different way. Um, there's this beautiful oblique uh, strategies uh, card deck by Brian Eno, which the concept is when you ever whenever you're in a creative uh, deadlock, you take one of the cards, and then this one says, "What would your closest friend do?" The next one says, "Cut a vital connection," and um, so on. The inconsistency principle. It's it's. Always first steps, ask your body. So it's it's a very very beautiful uh, philosophical art uh, project kind of. Um, sometimes there's no direct uh, meaning to take out of it. Um, but uh, there's this one card uh, which reads, um, I'm not sure if you can see, it's yeah. gardening, not architecture, and that's basically the motto behind it all. Because um, I'm not the architect of uh, my tracks and of my career and all these things. Um, I'm more like a gardener who's planting seeds and watering them and uh, trying to uh, give them the best uh, conditions to to grow and thrive. And um, in that sense, uh, yeah, my music is just uh, what happens when I make music. I I love that idea that, and I've heard Brian Eno speak about this, like the difference in the approach and not being an architect and you're and thinking about that as gardening is really amazing. And I wonder with your approach to electronic music and, and being a live performer and a producer, and I know you've done some streams and you've done some live shows, how, how much of that gardening aspect carries over to live performance is it similar where you're starting with some seeds like you have you know what seeds you're starting with how it grows may be a little bit similar to previous times or could grow into something completely different on a different night well um it depends i would say because um uh, part of my uh, awesome sound wave uh, tribe as i call um this group of live acts uh, associated with the with label where I've been releasing my album, they are just playing pretty much entirely live. Like Satoshi Tomi, for instance, um, I have infinite respect for that. Um, the way how they just create stuff on the spot, patterns on the spot. And, and, and of course, if, if you do that, um, every, every uh, night can be absolutely different and and from from the greatest night ever to to uh, a disaster maybe also even um my own life set doesn't really work like that which is because um the music i'm making doesn't lend itself so much and uh, to that to that type of spontaneity i mean it would be possible but not if you do it all by yourself right because um my music is I'm not making DJ tools per se and it's it's more like there's a lot more structure, a lot more composition, a um, lot more going on musically with all the vocals and all the melodies and all this kind of stuff and it's just impossible to, to create or recreate all of that all by yourself on the spot. So there's more um, pre uh, uh, produced uh, stuff going on in my live set and um, yeah, me me playing around with that and playing on top of that, but it's not uh, structurally, it's not uh, as uh, spontaneous as other uh, live sets would be. But this is basically because the music I'm making uh, isn't so suitable for that approach. And I'm, I mean, it's it's an ongoing process and my, my goal is to... to uh, go more and more into the uh, spontaneous side of things but I think with the stuff that I'm making there's a certain uh, limit to it also so it is very deliberate well um, at this point in my career everything I'm doing is uh, very deliberate yes I think I can I can say that because um, I mean I'm 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 the first to to still uh, uh, be be eager to learn new things and to to to, to broaden my horizon. But um, yeah, uh, I've I've um, uh, I'm past the point of um, haphazardly 
throwing out seeds and see which plant is coming up. Um, I'm, I'm, I know when I want to grow beans and want to when I want to harvest oranges. So, right. but at this time, at this time, yeah, um, there's a couple of things where I'm still uh, not making any plans and where I'm just uh, curious to see how things unfold and um, where I'm reacting to that. But at the same time, there's other aspects where I just um, don't leave anything to chance. And and Pele, your most recent album, seems like a very deliberately planted garden. Do you want to talk about what was the main... What, what what was your main idea going into this album? Well, uh, if we if we stay in this uh, metaphor, and I think it's beautiful because um, if if I think of it like this, um, it's a fairly it's a fairly wild gun. Right. It's 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 something where um, yeah. Nobody has come in uh, mowing the lawn for a long time. And there might be something <laughs> dangerous in there. Either something poisonous or some creatures hiding within that might come out to get you. Like, uh, I get a little bit of that from it. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a bit of a genre in a way. And this is, this is, um, this is, uh, well, the basic idea was, um, this was one and a half years ago, maybe, uh, where I got in touch with, um, the label and they asked me to to contribute and I was very happy about that. Um, but they said, um, I, or I said, yeah, cool. Um, I, I come up with an EP as soon as possible. And then they said, we only do albums. And then I was like, fuck, this is um, probably not going to happen because I don't have the time. And then they also said, um, we want albums and we want long pieces of music. And I was basically, are you kidding me? <laughs> how, how should I do this? <laughs> um, 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 uh, yeah, I always. Uh, and is that not something you're lo- used to? Well, um, not really. And I, I mean, I, I always have just said that I'm the hardest working man in show business. <laughs> and and um, so, where would I have to? Uh, where, where would I be able to to take the time to 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 even make this? But it turned out that um, this concept was very liberating. Because um, yeah, I just I just approached making the album in a different way, and when I started making it, the music just developed, and I I, I produced the whole album over the course of a couple weeks only, and uh, this is because I got inspired, and this is also because um, the way I've been doing it um, is a very quick process where I uh, don't added too much um, and where I'm working with long passages of mostly unedited synth recordings and stuff like that and and um, of course you could then go back and reconstruct it and 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 re remodel everything to the tiniest of details but this is a deliberate decision that I that I took that I just didn't do this and that I left things raw and that I didn't mow the lawn and it's it's kind of um, but I, there's I, beauty in that well, there's definitely. I mean, this this is the type of type of garden. If we if we stay in the picture, this is the type of garden I would prefer uh, in real life. Also, like, um, I think I think nature is such an amazing uh, thing, and um, if if it runs its course, um, beauty will be the result. It's it's it's. Um, <sighs> yeah, it's just. Is it a little well, bit uh, to to zoom out of the garden metaphor a bit? Yeah, I know you talked about being a political person at the top, and there's a track on here called "Poem for the Planet." So, is there a deeper political message within this? Well, um, I didn't write the lyrics. Um, Asla Rocca, who who performed the vocals, um, wrote the lyrics, and I mean, she's she's a poet, really. She's she's an incredible and ultra significant artist with what she's doing and i've been admiring her for over 20 years and well over 20 years and um i'm very 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 happy that um, we could do this collaboration finally because this was really a bucket list item for me to 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 create a piece of music together with her because i've always had 
such such a strong admiration for for what she did and she um i mean her lyrics her her poetry is just whatever she's doing it's 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 incredibly beautiful and incredibly direct also like um there's a couple i mean she 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 can really go to uh she can go to the place that uh where it hurts like there's there's this one um thing she did um there's there's videos of her performing live uh, during the roots the roots show and she's she's just um reading this um i think this without music she's just um reading this poem or whatever you want to call that about uh women being raped by their men and she does it in front of an audience on a Roots concert, which, um, yeah, I mean, usually um, you don't get the stuff being shoved in your face like that on a show like that. Right. And this is, I mean, when, when I say uh, she, she, she's not afraid to, 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 to go to places where it hurts because um, it's just brutally honest and, and incredibly beautiful at the same time what she's doing. And, and, and when we started, started uh, our collaboration, um, I how basically... how does that collaboration come about? Are you, are you seeing really, her work and saying, I would really like to include some of her voice in, some of her voice and words in my track? Is that, is that your first line of thinking? Well, um, I knew I wanted, I mean, I, I've always worked with uh, vocals and then knew I wanted to have one vocal piece on the album, not more, but one. And um, uh, just because the whole musical concept is a bit more loose and, and uh, like a jam in a way, um, I like the idea of having a spoken word vocal and not, not some, some conventional um, vocals. And and um, then of course uh, there's one person in the world um, I would call for that, and I reached out uh, to her through uh, King Brit, and he helped me get in touch with her. And um, yeah, when we finally talked and and she agreed to do it, I told her, look, I've been admiring your um, lyrics and your poetry for many many years, and I, who am I to tell you what to talk about? Um, just do whatever you feel like, and I'm trusting you. I mean, I, I have the email still. I wrote her, um, I trust you 200%. I'm not saying it. I really mean it. And 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 um, so I can't, I can't, uh, and I don't even want to give myself credit for, for having anything to do with the lyrics, uh, other than just uh, giving her every uh, free space that she deserves to, to, to do what she wanted to do. And of course, um, I, did the, I did the music last spring and then she did the vocals in the summer. And if, if we look back uh, to last year and what was going on in the world like, uh, at that time, like the two, two uh, big uh, things basically happening were, um, or in, in, in people's minds were climate change and the rise of authoritarianism. And I always um, viewed what she did in that context. And that now um, the whole thing can also take a bit of a different meaning is something that, of course, nobody... Well, that's the beautiful part of it. It, stayed rele it has stayed relevant. Like this record just coming out, it still makes sense. It's not locked well, into when it was written. Yeah, but I think this is this is also um, this is a great challenge when making music anyway, and this is the even greater challenge when you make an album. At least in my view, that um, I um, like probably people people could say about my music that um, it's not as cutting edge as other stuff when it comes to just being directly at the pulse of time. But this is not what's interesting to me. I like to 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 have a larger um, picture in mind, and if there's a fancy fancy way uh, of of creating wobbly uh, synth bass lines or weirdly pitched vocal samples of stuff stuff like that, I mean something that that can sound very contemporary at a given moment, but then maybe it sounds old after a while. And I'm I'm not really into. Uh, the the fashion aspect of music. I'm I'm really into 
seeing the whole thing a little bit more as as uh, part of a much longer continuity of stuff, and 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 um, I think that's the ultimate goal that you can achieve. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm doing it all the time, and it's for other people to 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 judge that ultimately. But I think it's the ultimate goal you can achieve as a musician that that you uh, are able to to craft something that um, both. Uh, is a good reflection of the time when uh, it was made in and 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 captured some of the some of the intensity of that moment, but at the same time transcends this as well and 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 creates some something more universal out of it, something something that that uh, can stand the test of the time and that um, maybe can have a meaning that also can change over time alongside the world that's changing around this right. particular piece of art, and so. Um, yeah, I th I think uh, I think that's really really important. And um, the album is now almost one year old in terms of uh, when I made it. But and I was um, I was hoping for it to come out earlier. It wasn't possible because of release schedules and vinyl production, which is now completely turned upside down because of Corona anyway and stuff. Like that. But um, uh, from from today's perspective, I'm really really happy with the release date because it it it, it sounded like it, it came just in time for this, in a way. Right, and what I think we're coming towards the end here, and it would be really interesting to know um, what what's next because you talk about the longer continuity in in the light of this current situation and in all those tools they have in your tool belt uh, mix engineering and music production and we, we can't go out and tour right now so what do things look like for you now do you start working on the next project do you start collaborating with more artists well i have a lot of plans um i uh had a very very productive uh 2019 and um, also the beginning of this year was super productive for me. And now for the past two months, um, I mean, I've been traveling. I got stuck abroad. Um, I was at quarantine at home for two weeks and couldn't leave the house. And so so I'm basically right now just really arriving back uh, at the studio. And I'm still I'm curious to see how things will unfold. Um, one big thing for me this year is that I'm I will move out of the space over summer, and um, I'm just starting the process of building my new studio, which is something that's uh, ch ch challenging and a bit daunting even in normal times, but now more so, uh, to say the least. But it's something that um, I also see as a huge uh, chance and something that's really, uh, really. Uh, Amazing and something I'm looking forward to 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 basically uh, yeah build uh, my future workspace for the next 10 11 years to come and so this is going to be super exciting over the next months and um, yeah I I made a very very important decision for me uh, in the past days and that is um, I've been pondering the question whether I would um, postpone releases that were already, already agreed upon and stuff like that and um, I came to the conclusion that um, I don't want uh, to postpone anything so I will I will continue with my original schedule and I didn't pull it now more than ever I think people are people need things to keep them sane in this time and then just like art in general we need more art in general to keep us believing in something during this time and we're all trapped in our homes and there's so much to be scared and worried about yeah i absolutely agree uh but my 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 line of thinking was that um whether it might be a waste to 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 release great club tracks at a moment when nobody can really dance, uh, at least the way uh, everybody used to dance. And I'm saying this uh, in front of the background that I've been making so many different types of music beyond electronic dance music. And so I totally agree with uh, yeah everybody having a lot of time. And if if you if you look at all the music sales and all that, I mean people people crave music these days. That's for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, I, of course there was the thought about um, 
why uh, why would it make sense to release dance music at the time where um, nobody can go out and dance? dance but yeah. Still, and, and even and and this this in front of the background that I've been, yeah, making so much uh, music beyond electronic dance music, but at the same time, um, and this is probably. Or, I mean, as a, as a live act, you have the disadvantage to DJs that you are less uh, flexible with the programming um, because uh, you can, or normally you play only your own stuff and you can't just choose from everything. But at the same time, this also means that if I release uh, my tracks now and nobody can really play them out there, I still uh, will be able to play them. Right. Uh, this is a beautiful thing um, as a live act that um, I can still play stuff that I'm releasing right now next year, even the year after, and nobody will complain about it. And as a DJ, of course, um, if if the amount of music you're playing is too old at some point, um, yeah, it's probably, uh, yeah, it's yeah. not exactly squaring with your job description in a way but so so I decided to do that and that means um, I have three uh, EPs coming out this year um, wow. after my album um, now um, and this is this is only the stuff that um, is in uh, yeah that's basically signed deals already and um, I can talk about one of them that's um, I'm returning uh, to Bedrock next month already, actually, and this is something I'm very much looking forward to because I've played the track twice live earlier this year, and um, it was just mental, and I'm really, really uh, looking forward to, to, to sharing that one. And then I'm going to do two EPs on two other labels, and um, the interesting thing about that is, I mean, I don't want to mention the names yet because um, I want to... Uh, keep this uh, to myself for a little longer, but um, these two are both labels I haven't been releasing on um, yet. And um, still labels I like a lot and labels which have been around for, for many, many years and uh, which are just um, incredible platforms. And uh, one of them is closer to what I've uh, been doing lately and the other one is a proper techno label which is also really really nice because um, the tracks uh, coming out on that label on that EP will be 128 and 129 BPM which is a lot faster than um, what I've been doing uh, for myself recently and so this is going to be interesting and then of course there's a whole bunch of other stuff in the works and yeah but this is this is what's on the horizon so far, I can say. So lots more to come from you, Hannes Bieger. I want to thank everybody who's tuning in and watching. And thank you, Hannes, for joining us. And this is a really thoughtful conversation. And I know the chat was able to take a lot from it. You're a very, very thoughtful artist. I really love um, uh, the fact that we were able to go so deep and talk so philosophically, but then hone in on some of these different aspects. One question from the chat before we go. Tori Grossman asks, do you have a release date for the Bedrock single? Um, it's gonna be in mid-June, yes. Mid-June. It's not, it's not going to be far, and this is, this is, I, I posted, I posted, uh, a video of me performing the track on my Instagram a while, I mean, I think this was still last year, when I made it end of last year, and, um, I know that many people are waiting on this one. I'm, I'm just this week. I got a couple of messages um, sending me the link to that video again. And man, is this ever going to be released? And so, and, and, and so yeah, I'm I'm really 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 looking forward to, to uh, doing that. Very exciting. And you can check out Hannes' Instagram if you go to the description of my stream. Make sure you go give him a follow. And also, make sure you check out the uh, sponsor for today's stream, 343 Labs, where you can sign up for online classes and learn how to make all kinds of amazing electronic music, no matter what level, if you are a beginner, if you're intermediate, or if you even want to dive into some advanced stuff, sound design, uh, synthesis, things like that. We've also got courses in songwriting. 
lots available with expert instructors new location opening up in berlin coming this summer so if you are berlin or europe based it would be great to see you out there if you're new york based stay tuned because we hope to open up the the school as soon as possible but we know the situation is evolving which is why you can get the same great electronic music education right now online at 343labs.com so I really appreciate everybody for tuning in. Hannes, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks to you. And um, I promise you, as soon as it's uh, possible to, to hop on a plane and visit you in New York, I'll be there. Amazing. So it's going to happen. Thank you so much, everybody in the chat. And we are gonna, we're about to sign off. You can check out Hannes bigger on instagram uh, spotify check out his latest release pele you should be following on spotify and all these other streaming services because it sounds like we'll get new releases very very soon and more to listen to so thank you all so much for listening or watching this has been tejo for another episode of tejo talks have a good one mm -hmm.